Good morning to the Association of Consultants for Liturgical Space webinar series for 2022. My name is Paul Barabo. I am filling in for our usual host who is Pam Hardiman. She is off in Europe and I'm filling in. This morning we have um, a great uh, sculptor as our webinar presenter. Her name is Michelle Vandenhuvel. She is, um, her studio is Benny Braun Studio, LLC, and she is a bronze sculptor living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her formal training is that of an art therapist. She has worked on inpatient psychiatric units and with traumatized children. Michelle currently works in both the liturgical and secular sculptural world. Her focus in both has been to create welcoming, inspirational, interactive, and touchable art. The liturgical sculpture is to help worshipers strengthen their faith. Much of her non-liturgical work has been in the field of public art, including both indoor and outdoor pieces throughout the country. Michelle, it is a privilege to welcome you to the 2022 ACLS webinar series. Thank you so much, Paul. Nope. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm still learning. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to my studio, Benet Bronze LLC. My name is Michelle Vanden Heuvel, and I'm a bronze sculptor from Albuquerque. I live with my husband, Michael, and our rambunctious standard poodle, Ignacio, in Albuquerque's <laughs> rural North Valley. Ever since I was a small child, I have carried a lump of clay in my hand. My dad was a psychologist and my mother a potter, so I have come to my interests honestly. Both were immigrants to this great country, and my dad was from Holland and my mom from Bavaria. My education is, as Paul has just said, as an art therapist, and I have a master's degree in this. My studio is one of my most favorite places on earth. It's not fancy, but it's a place that speaks to me of comfort, great comfort. When I walk inside, it smells of warm clay, incense, and wax. I have treasured every second and am blessed beyond measure to be working in such a special place. My sculptures range from tabletop to monumental to miniatures. Over the years, my imagination and love and encouragement for my family kept my fingers working as my love of sculpture slowly grew. Those little lumps soon became birds, animals, figures of the saints. This helped me to form the two central themes of my work, the liturgical and the secular. I work primarily in bronze, but also utilize other mediums such as stoneware, clay and paper mache. So these are some examples of my secular art. Um, we have here Sophia, uh, my Sophia, which is who is a dancing pig, a mirror that I have done, and another uh, project called uh, Becoming. So this is an example of some of my liturgical work. And if you can also see it behind me, this is an ombo that I'm working on. Um, now it's being shown in clay. Um, eventually it will be cast in bronze with a vertigree patina and golden rubbed highlights and a glass top. Um, this is Jesus and the Fisherman. And um, I sculpt for churches, for sacred spaces, and um, for individuals who are looking for spiritual art. And here's another example of some of my um, religious work. This is Saint Francis with his birds and his and his wolf and his and his deer. And there's a little bitty nest down there with some eggs in it. 
Um, this is a slide um, from Gaithersburg, uh, Maryland, Rio Lakefront, which was once called Washingtonian Plaza. And this is really where the idea of the coming together of community um, came from for me was uh, competing for this public art space and winning this, winning this competition, which was a, a great blessing for me. So this is Gaithersburg again, a sculpture in the public realm can create an area that welcomes and draws the community in to stay and visit. The installation in Gaithersburg was meant to be interactive. That means I want people to come in, I want them to sit with the work, I want them to touch the work, both for children, especially, and for adults. In addition to the two main works, there are multiple smaller works around the area that encourage people of all ages to seek and find. So they, they would come in, they would try to find the bronze book, they would try to find the shoes of the lead of the lead animal, and we'll get more into that. So one of the lead animals there is a, is a gentleman by the name of Friedelin, and he's a bronze bear, Friedelin being one of my mom's Bavarian relatives. Um, and he lives there in the plaza with Kimo the cat. They live in there in Maryland. Shops, a carousel, and grassy areas surround the lakefront. Children and adults frequent it, shop, they feed the ducks at the lake, and they love to visit Kimo and Friedelin. No wonder these bronze gentlemen decided to make Rio Lakefront their home. Kimo and Friedelin are also surrounded by some of their missing items. They ask via the inscriptions in two big cast open bronze books for their visitors to find their smaller bronze items like a suitcase, a beehive, a large bag of popcorn. It's wonderful to see as the years have passed because this has been there a while, how Kimo and Friedling come to be alive and loved for the visitors of Lakefront. They, they still love to go and visit these, these two, the cat and the bear. Here's another um, example of a, of a public art installation I did in Longmont, Colorado. Um, this is the Ro my Roosevelt Park installation, and this is Manilda G. Raff. Um, she's a human-sized anthropomorphic seated uh, Victorian giraffe, and she invites the visitors to find several of her prized possessions as they learn about the visit that President Theodore Roosevelt paid to the city in the early 1900s. So again, you can go and find her gloves, you can find her purse, you you can totally walk around the area and the, the children really love it to, to see if they can find her things. This was another uh, public art, art installation I did. This is uh, uh, Sweetwater Park in Arizona. And um, this is JR for Jack Rabbit Little Spring and he lives in Sweetwater Park in Arizona. So he's a human-sized jackrabbit um, who one day hopped over to Sweetwater Park in Peoria, Arizona and decided that he liked living there. He sits on his bench wearing his best fancy vest and hat. He also wears his special turtle bolo tie for the occasion as he waits for visitors. He's a stickler for time, however, and frequently checks his vest pocket for his turtle pocket watch. A friend of his made him his fancy vest and even included a picture of a coca pelli on the back. His only concern is getting that sneaky lizard to leave who lives on the back rim of his hat. Located next to J.R. Little Spring and the name J. Little, Little Spring is Arizona and it's derived from the Native American word for Little Spring, which, which is kind of cool. So he also has a large cast open bronze book um, and it contains his story as to how he came to live in the park. A contest was held for the neighborhood children to write the story of how JR came to live in Sweetwater Park. The contest was won by one of the neighborhood children and I inscribed her story in the book, his story in the book um, uh, that she wrote. And a big party was held by the public art folks. We had 
the neighborhood, we had the, the, the arts committee, we, we even had carrot cake for, for JR, um, which he loved. So a great day that was to have all this celebration to welcome this, this rabbit who now lives in the park. Um, the arts, as I said, the arts board was there, the mayor and the staff, and many, many excited children who really felt that this, this rabbit had come alive for them and was now living in the park. Likewise, sculpture for the liturgy can create sacred spaces that draw visitors in to rest, reflect, meditate, and pray. The sculpture helps the person to connect to their inner spiritual self while they also unite with their faith. That's really my goal, the goal of my, of my work, of my liturgical work as well. In our here and now culture, where so many things are temporary, the artwork should also have a lasting impact. Sculpture creates communities. Sculpture can positively affect the viewer and helps to connect us as a people from all walks of life. And this is a sculpture that I did called Milagro, Miracle of the Fishes and Loaves. Um, she is reflecting on the miracle that has just occurred um, where Jesus multiplies the fishes and the loaves and she's, she's praising God for this miracle. Some, sometimes art and sculpture can be part of something special that's just difficult to explain, like this miracle, how did this happen? So here we have, and I have to point out my, our beautiful granddaughter who, who posed perfectly for these pictures for me. Um, so art impacts development and brain growth. It absolutely does. And children's sculpture promotes creativity and expression. It's been shown that art improves brain growth and functioning in young people. Children who are exposed to the arts are four times more likely to succeed in other academics like math and reading. So when schools cut these programs from, from the curriculum, they really need to be adding more of these programs to the curriculum so, so children can succeed. So also art is used for healing. And in my work as an art therapist, I have many, many examples of how, how art as therapy is, is a beautiful, beautiful tool, and especially in working with children and children, disturbed children. Part of my background is, is that, as I have said, is that as an art therapist. I obtained my degree from the University of New Mexico, and following this, I worked with both seriously mentally ill individuals as well as traumatized children. I recognize the ability of art to help people to integrate and heal themselves internally. In the same way, art can help communities, towns, and cities come together to form a sense of purpose and become one community. And here is my friend Carlos, who um, has a very rough life, um, but absolutely loved Therese, my sculpture, Therese of Lejeu, um, the little flower, and here he is, he is just being with her and loving her. So here we talk uh, about, we will talk about the shrine of the little flower, um, which is a sculpture I did of her uh, in Albuquerque, um, and Father Vincent Chavez is the pastor. So there is a miracle associated with the beginnings of the little flower. Um, and it, it's going to sound a little, a little wild, but it actually did happen. And it's actually been documented by the, by the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. So I'll, I'll kind of give you, give you a little background here. Um, I met Father Chavez from St. Uh, Therese Parish Shrine of the Little Flower at a priest conference here in Albuquerque uh, a few years ago. We struck up a conversation about how Father needed a warm, interactive, 
sculpture of St. Therese at his parish. I completed a sketch for him of a seated little flower and the sketch sat on a table at his office for five years. So I find a copy of the sketch I had given Father Chavez in my studio one day, five years later. I dusted it off and I looked upward to heaven and I asked my recently deceased sister for her assistance in getting the sculpture created for the church. At the same time, Father is in his office anointing a woman who is dying of cancer. She is with her husband and sees the sketch of Therese. She has a huge devotion to Therese and asks her husband to do what he can do to see the sculpture is created upon her passing. So upon her passing, her husband <coughs> donates to the church half of the monies needed <coughs> to create the St. Therese sculpture. A week passes. Father Chavez is in the confessional. He describes what happened. He says that he slid open his screen and he hears the voice of a young man. The young man says, Father, I'm here about the sculpture. How much more money do you need to get it made? Father says that he's uncomfortable talking about money in the confessional and that the young man should just come to his office. The young man says, I'm not here to confess, Father. I am only here to see how much more money you need to get the statue created. Would this amount, the young man says, work? And father says again, I'm uncomfortable. Then he hears the young man's confessional door shut closed as if the young man has left. Father jumps up, runs into the church and inquires of two ladies seating there, seated there, which way the young man went who was just in the confessional with him. The man would have had to have walked by the ladies in the church to leave the church. The women look quite surprised at Father Chavez and say, no, Father, no one has been in the confessional with you. So that following Monday, Father is in his office and his secretary brings in an envelope addressed to Father Chavez. He asks her to open it, and it is a cashier's check for the exact amount needed to get the sculpture of Therese cast. Father then calls me and we begin planning the sculpture along with the labyrinth garden that father wishes to install the sculpture in. I cannot even describe the process of making this Therese sculpture. My hands flew through the clay. Everything was easy. My mold maker was floored how easy it was to make Teresa's mold. My production manager was miraculously given the wood needed so he could build Teresa's bench so we could cast it in bronze. The sculpture was cast and a relic of St. Therese was placed inside uh, underneath the sculpture, a, a piece I believe of her, her, of her veil. When Therese was completed and needed to be stored at our neighbor's house in their grassy tree backyard, people came from points unknown to sit with Therese on her bench and visit. I have no idea who these people were. Our neighbors graciously left their side gate open so Therese, the pilgrims could come and spend time with the little flower. Even the clay of St. Therese became an artwork that was visited. brother. Father's brother had desired to give his kidney to a friend in need. Upon going to the doctor to get a medical workup done to do the donation, father's brother was told that he could not donate. He was told that doing, upon doing the workup for the donation that they found cancer inside his whole body that he would be unable to donate. 
Father's mother, upon hearing this upsetting news about her son, decides to go to the church and pray with the sculpture of St. Therese. Father Vincent meets her in his office and says that she can't sit with Therese as it is July and the sculpture has no shade. Um, I've always telling him put a shade structure over there, but so far he, at this point he had not done it. Father's mother then says, it's okay, I'll stand next to the sculpture and pray. An hour later, his mother comes back into the office and father says, mom, are you still here? To which she replies, yes, I've been sitting with Therese. He says, mom, it's too hot to sit with the sculpture. To which his mother replies, the statue is cool. Father runs outside in the July heat and touches the statue. True to his mother's words, the statue is cool. Later the following week, father's brother goes in to have his workup done for his cancer. And the doctor comes back to him and says, you need to go home. Your cancer is gone. So that is actually a documented um, story of one of the miracles associated with the little flower at, at St. Therese Parish. Along with the mysterious donation of half of the Therese sculpture, Father is gifted with monies suddenly out of the blue to create Our Lady of the Smile. And, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with her. This, this is the statue that stood next to Therese's bed. Um, when Therese was gravely ill, she prayed to the Blessed Mother to cure her. She looked at the statue next to her bed and the statue turned and smiled at Therese. And from that moment on, Therese was healed. So Father Chavez commissioned me to sculpt my own version of Our Lady of the Smile. And it sits outside the main door of St. Therese Parish in Albuquerque. And this is, this is a close up here. And the parishioners love to, when they walk into the church, to go and to touch her hand and to touch her cloak. And um, she has... Uh, flowers carved on the back of her of her of her veil. Um, in actually, you can see those on my website if if you'd like to see those. So I talked earlier about other media that I work in, and some are uh, paper mache. This is a, a life size, larger than life size, seated uh, rabbit. Grand, grandfather rabbit is called grandpa's dream um, and he's fallen asleep in his chair and he's holding a book um, and the book is about dreaming of flying so he's he's having this dream about flying and um, he was very popular with the children who really thought this giant rabbit was asleep so and my, my husband graciously donated the church the uh, shirt for this sculpture so um, this is some of the other work that my mom, who was a potter, she and I would collaborate off and on things. This is one of her pictures with a little bird I made and then some more a stoneware, a little stoneware relief of the Blessed Mother. Sculpture can be a positive reflection of our society. Despite the divisions that seem to be quite apparent now, we are one human race. And given an opportunity and a catalyst, people will want to come together. What is my approach when I sculpt in order to bring together communities? First of all, I have to understand the community, whether lay or religious. That's the first step. And understand the vision of the others, the committee members, uh, communities, and individuals is very, very important. It's most important to me that sculpture in both the secular community and in the liturgical setting should reflect a positive, hopeful message. It should initially draw the viewer in, then welcome the viewer to sit, stay, and linger. Along with having a positive impact, my sculpture should be joyful and hopeful. It is also important to me that visitors, and especially children, should be able to explore my work visually, but also tactily with their hands, because that's really by touching is how young children learn. The work is not just to be viewed, but to be touched, felt, and have 
its essence absorbed. And this is a sculpture that I did of Franz the Bear um, in Park City, Utah for the, uh, uh, during the Olympics, it was a commission that, that I competed for and won. He's been very popular there. For example, in my way of the cross bronze stations, the visitor can feel Veronica's veil with their fingers as she reaches to wipe the face of Jesus as he carries his cross. The visitor can explore J.R. Little Springs vest and find his pocket watch and touch his bolo tie or feel the fuzzy slippers of the paper mache rabbit in Grandpa's dream. They can see and touch the fish splashing about in Andrew's net that he holds bringing together the community of the faithful as Christ told the disciples to do. And they can also pet the wolf that stands faithfully by St. Francis's side. And here is, uh, here is Andrew with his net and all his fish. I have a number of sources that announce public art competitions. Uh, nationwide public art calls for competition. They email me, um, private individuals call or reach out to me. And then I look for the call for art and decide if I can design and sculpt a work that would enhance the space and bring joy to the community. And this is actually our son when we installed Fronts the Bear in Park City. I create a sketch or maquette of my proposal and a letter of interest describing my idea for the space and the budget. After all the artists have presented their work, a winner is chosen. At this point, if it is me, I will request a signed contract and a third down to begin my work. That's usually how, how I, I work. Another portion before casting and the balance upon completion. I've had instances, unfortunately, where I've neglected to get the contract signed and put in many hours of hard work, only to have the project pull later. But good learning lesson. Um, and I've, I've, learned, I've learned not to do that anymore to get my contract first. So once the work is completed, I will arrange for installation or work with the organization to assure a safe and smooth transition. So Franz the bear, as I told you before, he is a giant bear who lives in Park City, Utah on Main Street. Franz was the result of a public art competition I won to create an interactive sculpture for the athletes and visitors of the Salt Lake City Olympics. He has proved to be quite a popular fellow, even boasting his own Facebook and Wikipedia pages. Visitors love to sit with him and touch him, as proved by his golden rub nose. Franz has brought the community together and is fondly remembered by all, even those from out of state will, will tell me, oh, I saw your bear in Park City. A perfect example of this staying power of community-centered sculpture. Franz continues to be alive in, in Park City. And here is an example of working as a team with other professionals. Creating a beautiful physical environment for my work is also important to me. Creating a lovely, warm, inviting site plan, working with communities, architects, and other artists is a great blessing to me. So Mr. Henry Lay owned a parcel of land in Louisiana, Missouri, right along the river. Having seen my work, he contacted me one day asking if I would like to travel to Louisiana to talk about a sculpture park that he was wishing to build on his property. My husband's son and I were soon standing on the beautiful piece of land in Louisiana that was about to become the Lay Sculpture Park. I was, I was gifted with the task of designing the children's area portion of the park. Mr. Lay felt quite strongly that sculpture and children go hand in hand. We had wonderful discussions of how this children's sculpture garden could be accomplished and soon Story Woods was born. Story Woods ties together children, reading and sculpture. Working with Mr. Lay and the architectural team and other members of the community, we designed the layout of the garden. It was a beautiful endeavor and 
certainly teamwork at its best. It was a lot of fun. It was a community effort to produce and became something for the larger community to enjoy. Amelia keeps the stories. This is Amelia. She's a monumental sculpture that sits at the entrance of Story Woods in Lay Sculpture Park. She's kneeling intently looking at the turtle on her arm. She is the story keeper. The animals of the woods tell Amelia their stories and she keeps the stories to tell the future generations of children. The children can actually climb up next to her. She's, she's six, five, six feet high and feel and touch the turtle and then put their arms around her neck. This is all in keeping with my belief that sculpture, whether in public art or the liturgy, should be touchable and interactive and welcoming. Installed next to Amelia on a sloped slab of concrete is a cast open large five foot by five foot bronze book. It's, on, it's mounted on a slope. It has many touchable things on the edges of the pages. It's inscribed with a welcome to Story Woods message and the children and their adults can physically climb up to the book and touch the letters and the big, big bronze mouse that's on its pages crawling across the pages. They can read the welcome message and begin their exploration of Story Woods. Mounted in various places around Story Woods are other smaller cast open bronze books that tell children about nature. I am so pleased that even today, Mr. Lay's dream about sculpture that is accessible to the public and especially to the children remains and is a site that is still visited by individuals and families and is free of charge as Mr. Lay wanted. I'm glad Mr. Lay and the Lay Center acknowledges that sculpture should be both visual and tactile. So this is, this is a little uh, uh, quote from the Lay Center brochure about Story Woods. So this is Franz the Bear, and the key to any project is creativity, which is definitely important, but probably one of the most important things. Input from the stakeholders, from the community, from, from, from the neighborhood. Um, I share my vision then, and uh, I try to be very flexible if people having a different idea or want something different, I definitely try to be flexible and to incorporate their feelings. And also persistence. If something doesn't turn out, keep going. You'll find a solution, you'll find a way, God will provide. In this way, sculpture can both represent and enhance the community, whether that community is secular or religious, uniting diverse people through a common goal. While some say art for art's sake, I believe that art should also serve a higher purpose. It should be thought provoking and touch emotions that many people may not be aware of. Sculpture should not be something that is on a pedestal and kept away from the public, but should be accessible and interactive, welcoming and inspiring. Art should have a lasting effect. As Will and Ariel Durant said, history is the struggle between art and time. Art should be the victor in this struggle. So here are some links um, to my website and to some of the public art um, and liturgical work that I have done, if anybody is interested. And uh, thank you for visiting my studio and taking this journey with me. It's been a real pleasure. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation and anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you again. Michelle, thank you so much for your presentation and for showing us the beautiful works of art. Thank you. That you do. Thank you. So we will open up um, our discussion if you'd like to um, Minimize your grade. Thank you. And um, we'll take any questions from uh, those of us that are gathered here for the presentation.
I will begin. Um, it seems um, so much of your artwork is, um, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to use whimsical in a, in a bad way. I mean, I think it is fun and engaging and playful and draws people in. Um, and, and my experience with a lot of religious art is that it often doesn't have that kind of playfulness. Have you done pieces that are specifically geared toward children in a liturgical setting or, or geared toward trying to draw in, um, in a playful way? Specif specifically, no. Um, I'm currently working on a sculpture of Kateri, uh, St. Kateri. Um, and I'm trying to put that really playful element in, you know, the turtle in her in her lap, the the oak tree growing out of the shell, the the, the birds and the flowers, and um, to me that that kind of interaction, it just that kind of welcome is is vital, especially for children. So that's one piece I'm working on. I'm um, working currently trying to put together a, an, another project um, with. Uh, with St. Therese, a little flower again. Birds, flowers, things flying out of her hair, floating, you know, just a lot of fun things. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Margaret. Here we go. Now I'm unmuted. Um, thank you for your presentation. I mean, I've got a technical question. Sure. Um, sure. Do you leave in, and I live in the Washington DC area and there are numerous examples around here and I'm sure other places of bronze sculptures where the patina is deteriorating because no one's maintaining them. And, and very in the, the Roosevelt Memorial is an example of that. Um, and um, so I'm just wondering, since so many of your pieces are outside, do you leave instructions for how they could, should be maintained Absolutely. or, or, um, or how? Absolutely. I always leave instructions on how to maintain them. And usually what, what I do, and I'm, I'm not sure how other bronze sculptors do it, but it's twice a year washing. Um, with a with a soap, um, rinsing, and then waxing twice a year, which is very, very important to maintain these sculptures. And I, I agree with you. It's very sad to see that where that's not being done. I, um, I, my, my rabbit in uh, uh, Peoria is the patina is totally rubbed off and is, has darkened just because I don't think those instructions have been followed. And it, it's not that hard really to just to give it a good wash and a wax. I do the little flower here twice a year for father uh, just because, you know, I, I love doing it and maintaining the pieces, but definitely maintaining them and keeping them waxed is very, very important. Absolutely. It's sad when you see it not being done. Yeah. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a comment. Um, I love the art that's tactile. And I had an experience of um, sisters in, a, in an assisted living place. And one of the sisters was visually, her eyesight was not that good. And so uh, people took her and showed her, there's a, an art piece um, by Deborah Luke, who uh, did yeah. a piece and, and yes. just helped her to visualize this art piece. And, you know, we don't normally think of people who are visually impaired. Um, I also had another um, piece in a hospital where uh, we thought about that, that yeah. people, not only children, but yeah. other people could go up and experience the artwork yes. fully. Yeah. So, um, you know, how many times, you know, people are like, don't So what a blessing, what a blessing. I, I as, as speaking as a therapist as well and having worked with deaf children for, for 
many and 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 sight impaired. Um, I had I had signs up on my work that said, "Please touch, please touch," and mm-hmm. parents would walk by with their children and say, "Oh no, don't touch that." It says, "Don't touch," and I said, "No, it doesn't." It says, "Please touch, please touch." So I changed my sign and I made it touching suggested, <laughs> but it it to me having those opportunities to where the sculpture and the art can actually reach people who normally would just be left out is so incredible. It's my production manager and I don't want to take up everybody's time, but was telling me about a sculptor that he knew who made uh, the alphabet bronze panels out of the alphabet for a, uh, blind children and he he would you know r for radish and he made a radish and then he in braille carved in radish so they could feel the word radish feel the radish he said it's just was an incredible uh opportunity to to draw these children in to just a whole world opened up to them to to be able to touch the sculpture and understand it and connect with it so that's cool. Uh, that's I love that. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you. Michelle, oh, go ahead, Linda. Oh, I've been admiring the, your anvil by you, Michelle. And I was Thank you. And I see, you know, I know Paul mentioned the whimsical. I'm what I'm saying in that is action. I can't see it clearly, but I see all these um, uh, shapes that are just um, pretty wild and pretty active. Can you tell us a bit more about that? The, the feeling I want to get from the ombo is salt water, fish splashing, men men hollering, men pulling in their in their in their nets. Jesus saying, "Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep <laughs> pulling." The, the fish are there. Come on, you guys can do it. Um, I want that that sound. I want the vision. I want the the emotion um, caught up, and that's probably why it looks the way that it does <laughs> but it's a, but it'll it, it's still a work in progress um the fish are larger than normal fish but um the disciples are pretty strong i don't think they mind pulling them <laughs> well, yeah great. that's the feeling i that i that i want to impart <laughs> Yeah, and uh, this is Gilbert. Uh, I agree. I think it's an incredible piece, the uh, Ambo, and and actually all of your work. I was curious though. Um, a lot of your public art pieces have like a creative narrative that you've crafted, for especially for the children about like missing items and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering if that comes from your uh, art therapy background. Is there something about uh, imaginative narrative that? Um, that works with children who are trying to either deal with any kind of complexity or just just in it engages them somehow. So I was just curious. Thank you. I, I, I think the the imagination in children, all children have an incredible imagination. And as we get older, we lose that. We lose <laughs> that childlike quality, that yeah. that fun, you know, rabbits jumping and rabbits flying and but it's there in children and it's just ripe and it's ready to be ready to be played with. And um, I think as a young child myself, I, I was always engaged that way. And I always had that wild imagination, you know, rabbits with hats and dogs with hats and, you know, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I think my work as a therapist, when I, um, started working initially with children, especially with the disturbed children, I knew that that, that fun imagination was still there somewhere. There was still that little, maybe that little seed of safe place in mm. them that um, if I could tap into that, into that little spot that had not been damaged, then the rest mm. would come along. And that's really really what what happened and happens in my work and art is amazing for that especially with the children um i've worked with traumatized children i worked with uh uh schizophrenic uh, adults um 
And the the feeling is the same. The art taps into that that little imagination that we all had as a child. And somehow that's that little seed that's still there. And um, once you start tapping into that, it's like a snowball effect. So many other positive things happen. But yeah, I've, as a child, I'm still like that. <laughs> I'm 64 <laughs> years old. I'm still <laughs> like that. <laughs> so it's the joy. It's the joy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have another question or comment. Um, do you ever ask people like in a liturgical art piece, what emotion they want that figure to have? I'm Absolutely. thinking of like um, a corpus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, Jesus can be dead. Jesus can be dying. You know, I mean, it's all different kinds of things. So what, what kind of a discussion do you have with people when you're doing something? How I say to them, how do you feel about it? What, how do you feel when you look at Jesus on the cross? What, what, what kind of feeling comes to mind? What kind of words come to mind? So we may go around the circle and we may discuss, well, I feel joyful or I feel sad or, well, how do you think that should reflect in a sculpture? I, I, I ask directly those questions and try to share and then try to pare down exactly how the sculpture should be created. And it's, it's, it's very cool to do that. I love to hear everybody's perspective on, you know, how that should be, but yeah, I, I, I love to get that input. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. One more, I'm going to ask another technical question because it's one of the things that uh, as you were going through your pieces, uh, we often see bronze work that has less color, more, I mean, either natural patina or just the, the color of the bronze. And, and I was just curious about the material that you use to add the color to your pieces, particularly that the roses yeah. Um, and, and how that wears, is that a, a chemical sort of Really, that... yeah, it's really, it, those roses are amazing that again, maybe part of the miracle story of this sculpture, but those roses look as vibrant as the day that they were patinaed. And it was really an experimental patina by my, my production manager who lives in Santa Fe and he was saying, you know, they're probably going to fade and they're, you know, over time because it's outside, it's in a, such a hot area, but boy, oh boy, those roses, those roses. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. They're still, yeah, I, I do. I wax them, you know, and I keep them clean, but yeah, they're still as bright as the day we installed. So, yeah, yeah. I, I love uh, also sculpture that is rubbed. I love sculpture that's touched. I love sculpture that's rubbed golden by people touching. And I know some artists do not like that they, because it rubs the patina away. But to me, that sculpture starts to absorb those, those emotions and those feelings like the station of stations of the cross. Um, it makes the sculpture come alive to me. And I do not mind that at all. I just mean it's well, it's just well loved, you know, so. Yeah. You're muted, Paul. I was just saying, Linda, it looks like you had a question earlier or was I, mis am I mistaken? Well, I, I did have a question. Um, the paper mache, Michelle, it appears to be sitting outside. Is there... Was that a temporary installation? Is there something you do with the paper mache to make it uh, stand up outside? And when do you use paper mache? Actually, I, I cannot use paper mache outside. We just put him out there to take the picture, but um, yeah, he's he's an indoor guy. He's inside, so he's, <laughs> yeah. He went to an art show and our son loaded him in, in the back of, in the, with the chair, sitting in a big chair, loaded him in the back of the truck his truck to take him to this art show that I was in. And I told him, 
co- cover them up. You know, I don't want people staring and, you know, I mean, it's a spectacle. Let's, let's not do that. You know? <laughs> so of course they did not do that having not listened to their mother and um, <laughs> they, uh, they uh, left it open and boy, oh boy, I was driving behind and two, almost two accidents of people looking like, is that really a giant rabbit asleep in the back of that truck? <laughs> <You> know, <so. laughs> no, but they're inside piece. The paper mache is inside. Yeah. Some of the stonework can go outside, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question about uh, children and um, have you ever, well, okay. You don't usually see artwork that's directed to children in churches, rarely. So I'm wondering if you ever have the opportunity to ask the children in a parish what saint or holy person means something to them that you could have in the church. I would love to be given that. You ever had that experience? I have not, but I would love to be given that opportunity. Absolutely. That would be that would be a dream come true to be able to do that. Yeah. I have not been blessed with that opportunity. Because I mean, what a discussion you could have with them. Oh my gosh. You know, first yes. of all. Yes. And yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or even in a hospital setting, you know, yes. where uh, where you deal with the children, it would yes. be really interesting to um, to yeah. be able to have that kind of a conversation. Yes. Yes. I the closest I came was a project that I bid on for a daycare center at the Denver uh, airport, uh, which was the closest thing. And we, I had so much fun with those children about what should be in this, in sculpturally in this daycare. And um, we, we even evolved to be putting in a garden that they wanted a garden and they wanted to be able to grow some vegetables and tomatoes and things in the garden. And um, it, and they wanted to be able to sit with the sculpture and, and have pretend food on the table, bronze food with the sculpture, um, which it would have been an incredible uh, installation. I did not, wasn't awarded it, but I competed for it. And it was just so much fun talking with the kids. It's really the closest I've ever come aside from my, therapy work, but yeah, it's, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, This is Gilbert again. I was wondering, have you ever done the paper mache art as towards like puppetry or pageantry work? I don't know if you're familiar with the bread and puppet theater out of Vermont, but I was just kind of curious if you've ever done that. I've always wanted to get a client to tell me they'd like to do some kind of, a, you know, a, a, a play versus, you know. But I'm just wondering if you've ever done that. I did in my in my younger years when I was in college. I I worked at the uh, community center in on South Broadway here, which is a it's very poor part of town, and we we did a puppet theater down there. Mm-hmm. There was a there, and we did paper mache puppets. There was a a puppet artist, and I'm I'm just her name is escaping me now. But we worked together and built this incredible puppet theater um, for the children down there off South Broadway, and it was it was very mm. fun, very fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love that. Love it. Thank you. Yep. It's messy. Anything messy for children is good. Children love messy. <laughs> So I keep telling our son about our granddaughter, water, mud, clay, paint, right, Linda? That's all, you know? (laughs) Just give him the supplies. Right. Amazing what they'll come up with. Right. So, um, Michelle, I also was kind of curious. It sounds like some of your art is a lot of your art is done either by a individual or or maybe a committee. Um, do have you work when you work in a parish setting or when you've worked in or have you had community uh, involvement where where it's a larger, more public sort of input into the formation of the art? 
when you're you're talking about my liturgical work too yeah or just any setting yes. where you've got like a large group of people oh, sure. actually involved in the creation yep. of that yep i've had i've had instances like that as well and again i try to listen to everybody take everybody's opinion into account um have meetings talk to people um try to hear what their vision is it's very very important and Definitely um, larger ones for sure. The the lay sculpture garden was probably one of my best examples about that. That was that was very involved with neighborhood architects, um, children of the community, uh, writing the story, including them. So it was it was just a lot of fun. And, but again, flexibility. You have to be flexible. You got to be flexible you got to change where you need to change and grow where you need to grow. So, well, we are almost out of time. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us today. And for thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. It's been an honor being a part of this and having you with us. God bless you. Thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. Thank Thank you you for your enthusiasm. Thank you.